So we are in the fourth week of our capital campaign, which means that we have this week, and then we have Consecration Sunday next week, which is where we're going to ask you to bring your pledge cards up that you either got in the mail or we have some in the back of the room. Ask you to bring them up in worship when you take communion and drop them in the offering plate. So I'll remind you what we've been doing this month is kind of talking about two things simultaneously, right? We have our 2023 operating budget push that we've been doing, which is just our normal annual church budget that your normal giving goes towards. Things like paying salaries and paying the HVAC bill and giving our children's ministry their budget and putting gas in the church buses, right? Things like that. And then this year, we also have this other thing that we're doing that's kind of a big thing, which is a three-year campaign, which will run from 2023 to 2025, that will completely pay off the debt that our church is currently under. It'll completely pay off our mortgage payment, which is about $1.8 million, or about $15,000 a month that we're currently paying. So that's what we've been doing. We've talked more about that the last previous weeks. We've really gotten the details of it. I'm not going to do that this week, but I want to make sure that you know we got two things going on at the same time. The first week of this campaign, we talked about what it means for us when we say that we are the body of Christ. The second week, we talked about how the Great Commission fits into our understanding of us being the body of Christ. In other words, what is our job as the body of Christ and how we should be living that out as a church. Last week, we talked about prayer, not only how we can be a people of prayer as individuals, but also how we can steward our church with prayer. We talked about how oftentimes during capital campaigns or stewardship seasons, preachers like me are really bad about only talking about how you can steward the church with your money. But the truth is, you can also steward the church with your prayers. And that's kind of what we talked about last week. And this week, we're going to begin to kind of wrap this whole thing up, because next week we're going to have a whole lot going on. It's going to be All Saints Sunday, so we're going to have candles all over the altar, and we're really going to spend more time talking about that than we are this campaign, but it will be the capstone of this journey. So this is kind of our last Sunday to really spend some time in in teaching during the sermon talking about this campaign, and we're going to talk about uh, generosity. And specifically, we're going to look at one of the letters— that Paul wrote to an early church in Corinth, in in 2 Corinthians. And we're going to specifically look at a section where he is writing to them about generosity and about their willingness to give out of their own abundance. And the more I read this passage this week, the more I realized how I really think it speaks very clearly and directly to our church and the journey that we are currently on, that we have been on and will continue into next week through this capital campaign. So I hope that you'll be able to see that with me by the end of this teaching. But I want to read it together first. So we're in 2 Corinthians. We are in chapter 8, and we're in verses 7 to 15. Now, as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we wanted you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I don't say this as a command, but I am, by mentioning the eagerness of others, testing the genuineness of your love. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this matter I am giving my opinion. It is beneficial for you, who began last year, not only to do something, but even to desire to do something. Now by finishing it, so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. For I don't mean that there should be relief for others and hardship for you, but it is a question of equality between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may also supply your need in order that there may be equality. As it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. This is the word of God for us, the people of God, and we say together, thanks be to God. In chapters 8 and 9 of Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, Paul's letter that we call 2 Corinthians, he is making an ask of this church 
in Corinth. He's asking them something that he's asked them before, that he asked them the last time he was there, because we see it also referenced in 1 Corinthians, the first letter that he wrote to them. What he's asking them is that they would be willing to give to Christians in need in the church in Jerusalem. And and this is nothing new, right? Because Paul is writing to the Gentile church, and typically in that time, Gentiles tended to have more wealth than Jewish folks did. So this is something that Paul's asked him before. He's like, look, I'm writing to you again, okay? I'm writing you, asking you to be willing to give to your brothers and sisters that are in need in the church in Jerusalem. And I absolutely love how Paul starts his ask. And I don't know if you caught it or not. We're going to kind of read back through some of the scripture this morning. So I want you to hear verse 7 again. Now, as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, in our love for you, we also wanted you to excel in this generous undertaking. Do you see what Paul's doing? Paul starts out and he just starts pumping their tires up. Do you see that, right? He's like, look guys, y'all are so good at everything. You are so awesome. You're absolutely crushing it in your faith, in your speech, with how motivated you are. But then he makes this really sharp turn, and I get it because he had to get there somehow, but when you notice what he's doing, you kind of see the the 90 degree turn that he takes right here because he says, but because we love you so much, because we love you so much, we also want you to excel in your generosity. It's kind of like the bait and switch a little bit. I mean, I hate to phrase it like that, but he starts off with pumping their tires and then they like blink and before you know it, Paul's asking them for money, right? I realize that this is kind of what we've been doing during this campaign. I I don't want to call it a bait and switch, right? But if you remember, if you remember, a few weeks back, we had things that we called spotlight gatherings, right? And if you attended one of those, then you know what we spent our time doing was simply celebrating who we are as a church, Celebrating what our children's ministry looks like and what our youth ministry looks like, how we take care of those who were shut in. We celebrated how we feel like our worship services are so effective in letting people experience the presence of God in this place. We gave thanks for our prayer ministry and for our prayer shawl ministry, which is a group of women that care enough about those going through a hard time that they make prayer shawls that we can give to folks in the hospital or folks that just had a baby born so that they know that their church has been praying for them during this season. And, and it, it is funny when we read Paul doing this, but I also really think this is an important place for us to start. I think it was an important place for us to start on this journey, to simply have an awareness and to give thanks for who we already are as a community of believers and how we already are spreading this message of the gospel and living into our calling that Christ puts before us. I want us to keep going. I want us to read verse 8 and verse 9. This is what Paul says right after. I don't say this as a command, but I am, by mentioning the eagerness of others, testing the genuineness of your faith. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor so that by his poverty you might become rich. When I read those two verses, I feel like Paul is anticipating someone asking the question, why should we give to this church in Jerusalem? Which I think would have been a completely valid question for a Gentile believer a couple of thousand years ago. This effort, this this mission that Paul is leading to raise money for the Jewish church to raise money for those in need that are in Jerusalem is is really a pretty big part of his ministry that we just don't talk about that much for some reason. It was really a through line of his ministry, and almost every letter that he wrote to all of the churches that he started, this is in some way mentioned. It was something that he believed was right, and it was something that he advocated for over and over and over again, especially to communities that he felt like lived in abundance and had the funds to give to these people in need. And if you remember Paul's overarching mission, if we can kind of zoom out just for a second, right, then you'll remember that Paul's calling 
was to spread the message of the gospel to the Gentiles, which was something that had never been done before. Before Paul, it was really pretty widely believed that unless you were Jewish, you couldn't be a follower of Jesus. And Paul has this crazy experience where he goes blind, and he hears the voice of God, and he realizes that what he is supposed to do with his life is take this message of the gospel and spread it to a side of town that has always been thought of as being unworthy of following this man named Jesus. The Jews and the Gentiles were divided communities. And Paul is a big reason for why the bridge began to be built between these two groups of people. Which is why I think it's a completely valid question for a Gentile believer to be asking of Paul here, right? Wait a minute, Paul. Why are you asking us to give to this church in Jerusalem? Why are you asking us to give to this group of people when they probably don't even like us? And I think if we're honest, we ask the same question sometimes. I don't think it's phrased like that, but we ask that why question, right? Why is my church asking me to give? Why should I be generous? Why should I put my money towards this when I could put my money towards that? Why should I give my money towards the church when I could give it away to something else? I mean, we ask that why question if we're honest with ourselves, right? I I think it's a natural part of discerning how God is calling us to give during a campaign like this. And Paul's answer for that question is what I lovingly call a Jesus juke. Have you ever heard that phrase before? Me and Becca were talking about it in Sunday school this morning. I mean, let's just call it what it is, guys. It's a Jesus juke. Paul rips it out of his back pocket, right? The reason you should give is because, bam, and he plays the Jesus card, right? He smacks it down on the table. Did you hear it? For you have known the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And the truth is, is that our theology for giving, our answer to that why question, right? Why should we give? Why should we give to the vulnerable? Why should we give to the church? Is that it's still exactly the same. Our answer is still exactly the same as it was for those Gentiles in Corinth that Paul was writing to in this letter. We are generous because Christ was generous first. We give to the vulnerable because Christ gave to us when we were vulnerable. We give because the only reason that we have something to give is because Christ gave it to us in the first place. Whether we're talking about giving our time or giving our breath towards something, whether we're talking about giving out of our checkbooks, right? I mean, the only reason that we have those things to give is because Christ gave them to us in the first place. The only reason we have it is because Christ was first generous. It's a Jesus juke, but I mean, it's, it's a Jesus juke that is, that is true. And it's something that our generosity is still deeply rooted in today. We give because Christ first gave to us. And then Paul finishes it out with these last couple of verses. And in this matter, I'm giving my opinion. It's beneficial for you who began last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something. Now finish doing it so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. For I do not mean that there should be relief for others and hardship for you, but it is a question of equality between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may also supply your need in order that there may be equality. So maybe you can kind of see the three buckets that I think Paul is hitting here in this section of his letter. He starts off by celebrating who this community of believers is and what they do well. He calls them further in their journey of faith and says, look, I also want you to excel in your ability to be generous. And if you're asking why that should be a part of your faith journey, it's because of who we believe Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us. And then he gets here, and I think the question that Paul is getting at here is not a question of why should we give, but a question of how much should we give. When I was in my final year of seminary, I remember going out to lunch with an older pastor that was serving at the church that I was working at part-time while I was in seminary. And he was pretty close to retirement, and he asked me to go to lunch, I think, because he, he felt led to maybe share some wisdom 
with me because I was in that season that's always really scary, no matter what your job is, where you're looking over the horizon of graduation, knowing that you're about to be done with school and you're about to actually have to go do this thing that you've been trying to learn how to do. And one of the things he told me is something that I don't know why, but it's just stuck with me. He said that being a pastor is like most jobs where you have to wear multiple hats on a daily basis. And then he started to list them out. He said, you have to be a teacher. He said, you have to be a good public speaker. He said, you have to have a little bit of politician in you because church politics can be unique at times. If you've been in a church long enough, you know this is true, right? You just have to have to have a touch of politician in you. He said, you need to be able to listen like a counselor during certain times and with certain folks. You need to be able to encourage like a best friend, nurture like a loving parent. You need to be able to be a truth teller in all that you do. And then he said, and you also need to be a fundraiser. And I think I remember that conversation so vividly is because it wasn't until he said those words to me that a hat that I was going to have to wear as a pastor was going to be the fundraiser hat. I don't think it was until then that it really clicked that this conversation would be a regular part of my job, that it would be a conversation that I would need to have with my church on a yearly basis from now throughout my whole career. And and look, if if I'm being totally honest with you, that hat of being a fundraiser is probably the hat that I resist the most of one that I really need to put on. It's the hat that I'm probably least comfortable wearing But I've recognized the more I've talked about this subject from last year to this year, that it really is an important conversation for us to be willing to have as a church, as a body of believers, as as a family. I think it's important because your generosity is going to have a huge impact on not only your personal journey of faith, your personal walk with Christ, but also on our church's ability to live into who God is calling us to be. All that to say, I've I've really thought a lot over the last couple of weeks, really over the last couple of months, what I I wanted to say to you in this moment. Because it kind of feels like this campaign has been building up to this Sunday, right? We talked about generosity on the last Sunday, right before we asked you to bring your pledge cards in. And, And I've really been thinking about what it is I should be saying to you in this moment. I've really wrestled with how to land this plane, not only during this sermon, but also kind of the plane of this campaign. And, and I just, I think this scripture has been so good for me this week. It, it's really brought me a lot of clarity. It, it's really made me feel grounded in what I feel like the call is upon us as followers of Jesus when it comes to our willingness to be generous. So I want, I want you to hear directed at you what Paul says to the church in Corinth. That, that's what I think you need to hear from me as your pastor this morning. I, I think you need to hear that I believe that we as a church, we as a community of believers, we as people in here in this service that we call the gathering, I think we do a really good job of a lot of things. I, I really do. I mean, the more I thought about it this week, the more I, I believed that. I think we do a really good job of facing hard questions of the, of the faith and facing them head on and not, and not running from those difficult aspects that can arise when it comes to following Jesus. I think we do a really good job of welcoming people here in this space and into our homes and into our communities who are looking for people to grow with and do this thing called life with. I think we do a really good job of serving Not only serving one another, but serving our community. I think we do a really good job of being the hands and feet of Jesus as much as we can. And I desperately want us to do a good job of being generous. I want us to be a people who excel in our ability to give out of our own abundance. Knowing that why we do that, why we make that a part of our faith journey, is because we are a people who follow a risen Savior. We are a people who have our generosity rooted in the most selfless act of all, a people who are seeking to exude generosity because of the generosity that we have already been shown by Christ. But I think this next part is the most important part, and and it's how Paul ends his letter. None of this giving, none of this generosity is motivated by guilt or is motivated by shame. Because if you heard Paul, he made sure to tell these people in Corinth that the call that is placed upon them 
is to give out of what they have, not out of what they don't have. He made sure that they heard him say that he is calling them to give from within their means, not above their means. He makes sure to say that that the most important part of all of this is not about the amount that you give, but about your desire to give. He even said that we're not called to give in a way that creates hardship for ourselves, but rather in a way that creates equality between those who have abundance and between those who are in need. I just love that part of Paul's letter, and I think it's so important. I think we miss it so often as churches that talk about money. Paul says that if the eagerness is there, if the eagerness to give is there, the amount does not matter. The gift is acceptable. Is that not a message of hope to y'all on a Sunday like this? For some reason, that just filled my cup up. Paul is asking us, this church is asking us, I'm asking you to simply give out of your own abundance, to give out of what you have. So next week, that's what we're going to ask you to do. We're going to ask you to come back to this place for All Saints Sunday and for Consecration Sunday and bring that double-sided pledge card with you. And if you got one in the mail, hopefully you still have it at home. If you need one, we have a few of them sitting on the table in the back. But it's going to give you a chance to commit generously to both of these campaigns that we have running simultaneously during this season. Because, friends, we've, we've celebrated who we are as a church over this last month. And I think we've really taken a good hard look at, at where God is calling us to go and, and who God is calling us to be. And my hope for us is that we would be a church, we would be a people of faith, we would be individual followers of Jesus who excel in our willingness and our ability to be generous, knowing that our generosity is rooted in that selfless act of Jesus, knowing that it is not about the amount that we write down on the card, but about our willingness and our eagerness and our desire to take on a generosity of spirit, because that is why we're here, because of what Christ has done for us, because of who Christ is, and because of where Christ is calling us to go. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey friends, I just wanted to take a moment and say thank you for tuning into our message this week in the gathering. We hope you found it meaningful and life-giving. As always, you're invited to join us for worship on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m., either in person here in the chapel or online. If you want to know more about who we are at Bluff Park United Methodist Church, you're invited to check out our website. There you'll find out who we are, what we have going on, and how you can be a part of it. As always, friends, if there's anything that we can do for you, you're invited to reach out to us. We are here to help you and support you in any way that we can. We hope that you're having a great week, and we look forward to seeing you soon.